The Dark Flower by John Galsworthy Section 28 Summer When Lennon reached his rooms again after that encounter with the Ercots, he found in his letterbox a visiting card, Mrs. Doon, Miss Sylvia Doon, and on it penciled the words, Do come and see us before we go down to Hale. Sylvia. He stared blankly at the round handwriting he knew so well. Sylvia. Nothing, perhaps, could have made so plain to him how in this tornado of his passion the world was drowned. Sylvia. He'd almost forgotten her existence, and yet only last year, after he'd definitely settled down in London, he had once more seen a good deal of her, and even had soft thoughts of her again with her pale gold hair, her true look, her sweetness. Then they had gone for the winter to Algiers for her mother's health. When they came back, he'd already avoided seeing her, though that was before Olive went to Monte Carlo, before he had even admitted his own feeling. And since, he'd not once thought of her. Not once. The world had indeed vanished. Do come and see us, Sylvia. The very notion was an irritation. No rest from aching and impatience to be had that way. And then the idea came to him. Why not kill these hours of waiting for tomorrow's meeting by going on the river passing by her cottage? There was still one train that he could catch. He reached the village after dark and spent the night at the inn, got up early next morning, took a boat, and pulled downstream. The bluffs of the opposite bank were wooded with high trees. The sun shone softly on their leaves, and the bright stream was ruffled by a breeze that bent all the reeds and slowly swayed the water flowers. One thin white line of wind streaked the blue sky. He shipped his skulls and drifted, listening to the wood pigeons, watching the swallows chasing. If only she were here, to spend one long day thus, drifting with the stream, to have but one such rest from longing. Her cottage, he knew, lay on the same side as the village and just beyond an island. She told him of a hedge of yew trees and a white dovecot almost at the water's edge. He came to the island and let his boat slide into the backwater. It was all overgrown with willow trees and alders, dark even in this early morning radiance, and marvellously still. There was no room to row. He took the boat hook and tried to punt, but the green water was too deep and entangled with great roots, so that he had to make his way by clawing with the hook at branches. Birds seemed to shun this gloom, but a single magpie crossed the one little clear patch of sky and flew low behind the willows. The air here had a sweetish, earthy odour of too rank foliage. All brightness seemed entombed. He was glad to pass out again under a huge poplar tree into the fluttering gold and silver of the morning, and almost at once he saw the yew hedge at the border of some bright green turf and a pigeon house high on its pole, painted cream white. About it a number of ring doves and snow white pigeons were perched or flying, and beyond the lawn he could see the dark veranda of a low house, covered by wisteria just going out of flower. A drift of scent from late lilacs and new-mown grass was borne out to him together with the sound of a mowing machine and the humming of many bees. It was beautiful here, and seemed for all its restfulness to have something of that flying quality he so loved about her face, about the sweep of her hair, the quick, soft turn of her eyes, or was that but the darkness of the yew trees, the whiteness of the dovecot, and the doves themselves flying? He lay there a long time, quietly beneath the bank, careful not to attract the attention of the old gardener, who was methodically pushing his machine across and across the lawn. How he wanted her with him, then! Wonderful that there could be in life such beauty and wild softness as made the heart ache with the delight of it, and in that same life grey rules and rigid barriers— coffins of happiness, that doors should be closed on love and joy. There was not so much of it in the world. She, who was the very spirit of this flying nymph-like summer, was untimely wintered up in bleak sorrow. There was a hateful unwisdom in that thought. It seemed so grim and violent, so corpse-like, gruesome, narrow, and extravagant. What possible end could it serve that she should be unhappy? Even if he had not loved her, he would have hated her fate just as much. All such stories of imprisoned lives had roused his anger, even as a boy. Soft white clouds, 
those bright angels of the river never very long away, had begun now to spread their wings over the woods, and the wind had dropped so that the slumbrous warmth and murmuring of summer gathered full over the water. The old gardener had finished his job of mowing, and came with a little basket of grain to feed the doves. Lennon watched them going to him, the ring doves, very dainty and capricious, keeping to themselves. In place of that old fellow, he was really seeing her, feeding from her hands those birds of Cyprus. What a group he could have made of her with them perching and flying round her. If she were his, what could he not achieve to make her immortal like the old Greeks and Italians who in their work had rescued their mistresses from time? He was back in his rooms in London two hours before he dared begin expecting her. Living alone there, but for a caretaker who came every morning for an hour or two, made dust and departed, he had no need for caution. And when he had procured flowers and the fruits and cakes which they certainly would not eat, when he had arranged the tea-table and made the grand tour at least twenty times, he placed himself with a book at the little round window to watch for her approach. There, very still, he sat, not reading a word, continually moistening his dry lips and sighing, to relieve the tension of his heart. At last he saw her coming. She was walking close to the railings of the houses, looking neither right nor left. She had on a lawn frock and a hat of the palest coffee-coloured straw with a narrow black velvet ribbon. She crossed the side street, stopped for a second, gave a swift look round and came resolutely on. What was it made him love her so? What was the secret of her fascination? Certainly no conscious enticements. Never did anyone less try to fascinate. He could not recall one single little thing that she had done to draw him to her. Was it perhaps her very passivity, her native pride that never offered or asked anything, a sort of soft stoicism in her fibre, that and some mysterious charm as close and intimate as scent was to a flower? He waited to open till he heard her footstep just outside. She came in without a word, not even looking at him, and he too said not a word till he'd closed the door and made sure of her. Then they turned to each other. Her breast was heaving a little under her thin frock, but she was calmer than he, with that wonderful composure of pretty women in all the passages of love, as who should say, This is my native air. They stood and looked at each other as if they could never have enough till he said at last, I thought I should die before this moment came. There isn't a minute that I don't long for you so terribly that I can hardly live. And do you think that I don't long for you? Then come to me. She looked at him mournfully and shook her head. Well, he had known that she would not. He had not earned her. What right had he to ask her to fly against the world, to brave everything, to have such faith in him as yet. He had no heart to press his words, beginning then to understand the paralyzing truth, that there was no longer any resolving this or that. With love like his, he had ceased to be a separate being with a separate will. He was entwined with her, could act only if her will and his were one. He would never be able to say to her, You must. He loved her too much, and she knew it. So there was nothing for it but to forget the ache and make the hour happy. But how about that other truth, that in love there's no pause, no resting? With any watering, however scant, the flower will grow until its time comes to be plucked. This oasis in the desert, these few minutes with her alone, were swept through and through with a feverish wind. To be closer, how not try to be that? How not long for her lips when he had but her hand to kiss, and how not be poisoned with the thought that in a few minutes she would leave him and go back to the presence of that other who, even though she loathed him, could see and touch her when he would? She was leaning back in the very chair where in fancy he had seen her, and he only dared sit at her feet and look up. And this, which a week ago would have been rapture, was now almost torture. So far did it fall short of his longing. It was torture, too, to keep his voice in tune with the sober sweetness of her voice, and bitterly he thought, How can she sit there and not want me as I want her? Then at a touch of her fingers on his hair he lost control, and kissed her lips. Her surrender lasted only for a second. No, no, you must not. 
that mournful surprise sobered him at once. He got up, stood away from her, begged to be forgiven. And when she was gone, he sat in the chair where she had sat, that clasp of her, the kiss he had begged her to forget, to forget. Nothing could take that from him. He had done wrong, had startled her, had fallen short of chivalry, and yet a smile of utter happiness would cling about his lips. His fastidiousness, his imagination, almost made him think that this was all he wanted. If he could close his eyes now and pass out before he lost that moment of half-fulfillment. And the smile still on his lips, he lay back, watching the flies, wheeling and chasing round the hanging lamp. Sixteen of them there were, wheeling and chasing, never still. End of section 28 Read by Sandra.